what we have in the world today is a situation not unlike the situation in 1914, where you have an uneasy balance between the powers. You have them jostling for advantage, um, jostling for, in the case of pre-1914, jostling for power within Europe, but also around the world, um, competing with each other in trade, but also competing with each other to try and gain influence. And I think we're seeing very much the same thing today. Hi, and welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series podcast. Our guest today is Margaret McMillan, author of the books Paris 1919 and The War That Ended the Peace. She's also Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Toronto and an Emeritus Professor of International History at Oxford University. Margaret and I spoke about the war in Ukraine, Putin's personal background and how it shaped him, as well as the power of individuals to shape world events, a theme which McMillan has explored in her work. We also discussed Canada's complacency when it comes to defense and security. And finally, we discussed whether today's geopolitical environment has any resemblance to that of the years leading up to the First World War, a time period Macmillan specializes in. Hope you enjoy. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit cdainstitute.ca or follow us on Twitter at CDA Institute. Dr. Macmillan, it is a tremendous honor to host you for our program today. I'd like to start things off with a question that you've brought up and dissected in your work before about the power of individuals. You have said that the greatest conflicts in their outcomes have often been shaped as much by personal leadership as by resources or military strength. Do we underestimate the power of individuals to shape world history? Um, there's been a trend in history, which I think has got a lot of validity, to look at the great forces that will lead to great events in history. So to look at the economic forces, the sociological forces, political forces, and to argue that these are much more important than who happens to be alive at a particular moment. But it seems to me that when you have people in positions of great power who have the authority to take their countries into war or keep them out of war, that in fact you do have to look at the individual. And I think we've become more aware of this with what's happening in Ukraine. I would describe it as Putin's war. I think he wanted it. I think he brought it about. I think given his position in, in Russia, the war would not have happened unless he wanted it. And so I think sometimes you have to take into account the individual. Louis the Fourteenth. In, this, in the 17th century wanted glory. And he saw glory coming from successful war. So I think it can matter depending on the time and the circumstances. And there's just been yet another biography of Putin. I mean, there's a lot that's not known about him, but there's actually quite a bit known. And I think clearly his background in the secret services mattered. Um, he developed um, as a young man in a world in which conspiracies were suspected everywhere in which those in, in, with, with the levers of power exercise them often in a very secretive way. And of course, he comes out of a society which certainly under the Bolsheviks, who became the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, was organized in a very top-down way with a very small group of people at the top. Of course, Stalin, the, the obvious uh, one, who basically was a dictator with, with unlimited or virtually unlimited powers. And, and so those are the models he had before him, even though he has repudiated communism, says he, he doesn't approve of communism, he does say that Stalin was a great leader. And he looks further back, of course, to some of the other great despotic leaders in Russian history, he often compares himself to Peter the Great. On the topic of the influence of personalities on world events or history, why, given his extraordinary power, wealth, and control over the Russian state, do you think Putin would invade Ukraine? Where might we be today if Trump were still in power instead of Biden? How has Biden's leadership influenced the trajectory of this conflict? And furthermore, what might the state of Ukraine be right now, if not for Zelensky? Um, why did Putin think that he could make war? And I think he thought he could make it because he thought he'd get away with it. And he had got away with it before. He'd got away with it when he sees Crimea. He had got away with it in Chechnya. He'd got away with it in Syria. He got away with it by threatening war against Georgia. And so he'd come to see war as a usable tool of state. And he assumed that Ukraine would not fight. I mean, that's very clear. I mean, I think, you know, you look at the, that big Russian column that came into Ukraine and they thought they were going to have simply an easy drive down to Kiev. They would be able to take the city over. There'd be no resistance. They'd set up a puppet government. There are stories, which I believe, because I've seen enough of them, that in the captured luggage that the Ukrainians captured of Russian officers, there were dress uniforms. And so they were planning a victory parade. He thought Ukraine, Putin thought Ukraine was weak and divided and, and would not stand up to Russia. I think also what you have to take into account is his own sense of history, because he's thinking of a different history than many of his neighbors. And the history he's thinking of is of a great Russia. He wants to restore the greatest boundaries of Russia. 
And he has this view, and he said this in this rather long essay he wrote last the summer before last, uh, last summer rather, um, that the Russians and Ukrainians are one people spiritually, that they, they're, the Ukrainians are part of the family and should be within the Russian tent. And Kiev, of course, I and mean, one of the ironies is Kiev is seen by, by Russian nationalists like Putin as the birthplace of Russia. Um, and so in a curious way, he's prepared to destroy the birthplace in order to prove a point. I think also he thought the West would not respond. And he and many of those around him have come to think of the West as weak, divided, decadent. Um, you notice that he goes on and on about the sort of social customs in the West. He talks about the ways in which gays are tolerated. This, this to him, same-sex marriage, this to him is a sign of weakness and decadence. And I think he's been very much surprised. I think if Trump was still president, then I think you would, you would probably find a very different Western response. What I think has taken Russia by surprise are two things. First of all, the resistance of the Ukrainians, which if anything is growing. And second, the willingness of the West, to certainly large parts of the West, led by the United States to give them the supplies they need. And I think with a different president, if Trump had been elected for a second term, I suspect none of that would have happened. The United States would not have taken a leadership role. And so to go back to your original question, yes, at certain points, who's in power does really matter. I think Zelensky has been key. And of course, it, you can understand why Putin and others underestimated Zelensky. I mean, this was someone whose approval rating was, I think, about 28% when the war started. There were all sorts of problems in Ukraine, um, you know, divided country, politically divided, problems with corruption. You know, there were, there were problems. And Zelensky was a former comic. And so I think most people wrote him off. They said, this guy, you know, is a pushover. And I'm sure that's what Putin thought. And Zelensky has proved to be the man of the hour. And whatever you think of his leadership, it is clear to me that it's made a difference. And he has a great capacity to speak, not just to the Ukrainian people, which I think is very important. He's speaking to them, he's rallying them, he's making them um, come together or helping them come together, but he's also got a great capacity to speak to the West. And I think that is very important. And I think what he's done um, is make the West realize that it needs to defend its own values, its democratic values. Because one of the other things that Putin, I think, disliked a great deal about an independent Ukraine, not only did he see it as illegitimate, but he saw it as a threat to his own rule because having a neighbor like Ukraine, which was prospering for all its problems, it was doing better economically than Russia was, it was more democratic and open than Russia, and that's what he didn't want his own people to see. Now, the response in the West, I think, has, has I think, been led by the United States, but, and Biden, Biden administration has been very firm on this, and they have gone a long way to supplying Ukraine with what it needs, but also to, to encouraging their allies to do the same. But the response is not just led by the United States, and I think that's important. I think one of the key things that happened is the reaction of Germany. Now, you can argue that's been too slow, and you can argue they should have been delivering weapons more quickly, but the Germans have reversed what has essentially been a policy of decades to spend more on the military, to take more of a leadership role. The fact that Sweden wants to join uh, Sweden and, and Finland want to join NATO, again, is an extraordinary reversal. I mean, this is something that would not have happened without this war. And so I think you're seeing a number of reactions in democratic countries, not always strong ones. I mean, there are democratic countries or partly democratic countries, let's say partly democratic like Hungary, which prefer to try and uh, trim and try and try and keep on good terms with Putin. And they've just had a delivery of, of Russian gas. Um, and so in a way it's paying off for them. But I think the, the reaction of the West has actually been surprisingly strong. And I think it's taken Putin by surprise. And of course, his only reaction really is to double down and try and seize even more territory and, and use even more brutal means. Historians and international relations scholars have suggested that the outbreak of World War I was in part the result of a breakdown in the balance of power. Do you think the same could be said now with the ongoing conflict in Ukraine? Well, the First World War is so much debate, and I think we will never come to a consensus on it. Um, it's also used, it's really in the foundation of a lot of, a lot of modern political international relations theory. Um, you know, was there a balance of power? Um, are balances of power inherently unstable, or can you see them as, as providing a sort of stability? Um, I would argue there were other factors that led to the First World War. I think there were reckless policies, in my view, on the part of Germany. There was the accident, and I think we should never overlook accident. There was the accident of the Archduke getting assassinated in Sarajevo in 1914, which gave Austria the excuse it had been looking for to try and destroy Serbia. And so I think, you know, there are the longer term factors and then there are the short term factors.
But clearly what we have in the world today is a situation not unlike the situation in 1914, where you have an uneasy balance between the powers, you have them jostling for advantage, um, jostling for, in the case of pre-1914, jostling for power within Europe, but also around the world, um, competing with each other in trade, but also competing with each other to try and gain influence. And I think we're seeing very much the same thing today. And we're also seeing what you saw before 1914, we've seen before in history, you have a power which may be declining in power. That was Great Britain and the British Empire before the First World War, and possibly, I say only possibly, the United States today, although I think that's far from a foregone conclusion. And then you have new powers, new players, who want their place, as the Germans put it before 1914, they want their place in the sun. And you have a China now, which is asserting itself, saying that we once, you know, we were great in the past, we want to be great again. And that does make for a sort of instability. It can be managed. And in fact, Germany and Great Britain were rivals before the First World War. Germany and the United, uh, the United States and, and Britain were rivals before the First World War. But one led to a war and one didn't. And that was because the British and the Americans managed their rivalry and, and came to an agreement. And I think it's still possible that the United States will manage its relations with China. And China, of course, is, is key for a lot of American policy, will manage its relations with China so that the two powers come to coexist. At the moment, the signs aren't looking very good. It's a particularly tense time. You have said that Canada is complacent about defense and security. In what ways do you think we've become complacent? And what do you think are some of the reasons for this complacency? Look, we've lived next to the United States, which has been the world's great power and, and after 1989, the end of the Cold War was the only superpower left in the world, at least for a time being. And we've got used to the idea that we're under the protection of the United States and therefore we don't need to spend a lot on defense because the United States will do it. I mean, our contributions have been among the lowest um, per capita in terms of our, our GDP of almost any NATO nation. And I think we have got simply got used to the idea that we don't really need to do anything very much. Possibly also that we have been so preoccupied with our internal issues, um, constitutional issues, uh, questions of how to accommodate um, different regions and provinces, and it looks like we're about to start another one with Alberta, um, that we haven't really been noticing the world. And I think sometimes we, we simply don't recognize that the world is becoming more dangerous. And I think a particular thing that we need to be really concerned about, A, if the United States turns even more inwards, which might well happen under a Republican president, we just don't know. Uh, but B, what is happening in the Arctic? Um, with global warming, the Arctic is now becoming a lot more accessible, a lot more open. There is a scramble there already for, for minerals, including rare minerals. And the Northwest Passage is becoming more of a possible waterway for trade and, and, and for, for others, for navies. And I think we are looking at a new challenge in the North, which we're really not, we haven't been focusing on, um, and we're not really well equipped to deal with at the moment. Dr. McMillan, you've been really great and it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, before we wrap up this interview, I have one more question. Uh, in Paris 1919, you wrote that in the fluid world of 1919, it was possible to dream of great change or have nightmares about the collapse of order. Looking at the world today, during this time of global change and great power politics, how do you feel about what's ahead? Great change or nightmares? Both, I think, um, which isn't much of an answer, but I think, I think we have to be optimistic because otherwise we just give up. But we do face, as a species, a very great challenge indeed in, in global warming. You know, the planet will survive, but it's not at all clear if we go on the way we're going on that the, the human species is going to survive for, you know, into the next centuries. And I think we also face a, a series of overlapping challenges in the world. We're seeing the unwinding of globalization. We're seeing more protectionism. We're seeing polarization, not just politically in societies, but we're often seeing polarization economically. Um, the middle classes are being squeezed and, and you're seeing um, an impoverishment of, of the lower classes and increasing wealth um, being concentrated in very few hands, which I think is always bad for society. And we're seeing regional rivalries which could spill over into something broader um, in the Pacific, for example, um, but also the rivalry now between China and India, which people perhaps should pay more attention to. And, and there are other parts of the world which continue to be troubled. And so I think we have to keep on trying. We should remember we have institutions which have served us. We have a, a capacity to work with each other. Um, 
And I, let's hope that um, we recognize that and, and do it. I, I mean, I will be optimistic, but I think we'd be foolish to ignore some of the worrying things out there.